So real quick, greenhouse effect, you've heard about it. Uh, the sun warms the earth. The earth, gets, as it gets warmer, begins to radiate heat. Uh, there are gases in the atmosphere, molecules that absorb some of that heat and re-radiate it in all directions. That's the greenhouse effect. We like the greenhouse effect because on the whole it keeps the earth uh, about 60 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it would otherwise be, so that's a good thing. But as we've added more things, as you know, chiefly carbon dioxide, a few other things, uh, we're starting to make changes in that greenhouse effect and we're starting to see some of the results of that. Uh, here's the temperature, uh, instrumental temperature going back to 1880 from NASA. Uh, that's about as far back as we've got good instrumental records. We can go much further back using other means. Uh, if you were paying attention to the news over the last couple of weeks, you probably saw that uh, uh, another independent group uh, analyzed all the temperature records exhaustively, actually funded by the oil industry, the Koch brothers in part, and uh, to no surprise of the scientific community came up with exactly the same results that people have been getting for the last 50 years. So um, in, in addition to that, there are still some other people who are out there saying you can't trust the thermometers, you can't trust those evil scientists, they're lying to you about global temperatures. About uh, three or four years ago, NASA did a study where they put together uh, 29,000 sets of data, physical and biological data. So this would be when the ice melts on your river, uh, what's the peak flow time of that mountain stream coming off the glacier, when do the birds migrate, when do the flowers bloom, when do the fish uh, 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 do whatever they do. And um, so 29,000 data sets almost 90% changing consistently in a direction of warming. So not only are the thermometers and the satellites and the, the buoys out in the deep sea telling us a consistent story, but the planet itself is telling us a very consistent story about climate change. Uh, right here in our local uh, area here, uh, Lake Superior, uh, measured to be about four degrees Fahrenheit warmer during the summertime than it was just 30 years ago. Just a, an eye blank in geologic time. And if you've been up there in the last few years, it feels more like 40 degrees warmer because uh, it's the difference between being able to get into it and not, which was historically the case. Uh, you were taking your life in your hands to get into Lake Superior. We're also seeing more extreme events. This is a graph uh, that comes from the blog of uh, John Nielsen Gaiman, who is the state climatologist for Texas. And he graphs uh, temperature and rainfall for Texas summers going back as far as he could go back. So here's your rainfall. <coughs> Wetter is over here. Drier is over here. And here's your temperatures, high temperatures up there. So you've got some wet years like 2004, not so warm, and you've got some dry years or hot years and dry years up here like 54. 1934, Dust Bowl, very dry, very hot. Uh, here's 2011, okay? So that is what statisticians call an outlier. Get used to it. Extreme events. We're going to be seeing them more and more and more, okay? So uh, the biggest question that you'll get from people when you're trying to explain climate change, the number one question is, how do we know this isn't some kind of normal cycle? <coughs> we know because we've done exhaustive fingerprinting processes. We can tell how much light is coming in from the sun because we have satellites that will tell us that. And we can also measure the amount of radiation that is coming out from the Earth, also measured by satellite very accurately. And we know that the planet is in an energy imbalance and has been uh, for some time. Uh, one of the studies that was particularly telling on this uh, was uh, measuring the uh, radiant energy coming out from the planet over about a 25-year period and what, how it changed. Uh, and what we saw was over that 25-year period, uh, more energy was getting absorbed, was not getting out from the planet, and moreover, it was in exactly the wavelengths where we would expect it to be that are associated with uh, methane and CO2. So this is what we would call a, a fingerprint. And there are probably a few dozen major fingerprints of climate change and maybe hundreds or thousands of minor uh, fingerprints. So that process has been done exhaustively and it's 
uh, it really leaves no room for doubt. Uh, now people will say, but the earth has changed so many times in the past. Uh, we know it's been hotter, we know it's been colder. Uh, you know, what's up with that? You know, couldn't this be a, 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 a process like what we saw perhaps back in the ice ages? We know that uh, the earth has had glacial periods, it's had interglacial periods uh, every 100,000 or 200,000 years, especially for the last uh, 3 million or so. Well, people that are much better at uh, celestial mechanics than I am have exhaustively looked at this. We know that there are changes in the, in the uh, rotation and the orbit of the earth uh, that are on very long cycles. Most of you are aware that the earth uh, has what was, is called precession, uh, it's like a top on a table and, and it has kind of a wobble to it as it rolls around. That's about a 21,000 year cycle, okay? Uh, but there are some other cycles. For instance, that axial tilt of the planet varies from about 22 degrees up to about 24 and a half degrees. And um, that is about a 41,000 year cycle. And just to give you an idea of how that works, uh, if uh, this gentleman, say, was the sun, and I am the earth, and I'm not going to make my head spin completely around it, uh, but uh, if I'm tilted a little bit more towards him, then it's going to get warmer up here, and if I'm tilted a little bit away, it's going to be colder up here. So that's part of the cycle, 41,000 years. Then there is uh, the orbital... Uh, path of the earth around the sun, which is not exactly circular, and it varies from more circular to more elliptical, not quite this elliptical, but you get the idea. That is a two cycles, one's 100,000 years and one is 400,000 years. And we know uh, when, when uh, people run the numbers on this, people who do this for a living at NASA, uh, we, we know that this is basically what takes the Earth into and out of ice ages about every 100 to 200,000 years. And we also know that that's not, none of these orbital factors are really in play right now. First of all, the change that we're seeing right now is much too fast. These things happen over uh, tens of thousands of years. Uh, and, uh, and, fi and finally, if anything, we should be seeing a very, very, very slight cooling which would, over the next 20 or 30,000 years, all things being equal, take us into another ice age. But in fact, what we've seen is a pretty sharp uptick over the last uh, couple hundred years, especially. So people will say, but it's got to be the sun. There's something going on with the sun. And again, uh, we can measure very accurately what's coming out of the sun. We have satellites. They do a very nice job. And what they're telling us, uh, here's total solar irradiance everything that comes out of the sun. Uh, we know that it uh, was rising a little bit up until about 1950 or so, but it's been essentially flat since then. You see the little 11-year cycles, but basically they average out. So solar energy has been pretty much flat for the period of time when we've seen some of the most dramatic warming. Now, uh, looking down at the planet, the, uh, the effect that probably jumps out most if you were in a spacecraft or for instance, a satellite, uh, you would see changes in the northern polar ice cap. And this is the uh, ice cap as it was in uh, September, just a couple of months ago, at its uh, minimum for 2011. And you see that uh, uh, we're open up at the uh, uh, northeast passage and at the northwest passage here. So basically, you could now circumnavigate that whole uh, Arctic Ocean, which was something that was impossible to do. Uh, up until very, very recently. And, but now the uh, Russians are actually spending an awful lot of money up here on new ports, new icebreakers, uh, charting, and, and everything they're going to need because they feel that uh, this is eventually going to be as busy a seaway as the Suez Canal as this uh, begins to open up. So we've been watching this for the last... Uh, 30-some years since we've had good satellite data on it. Um, it's been gradually declining. 2007, we saw a spectacular, unexpected drop that had the climate scientists really scrambling, wondering what was going to happen next. Uh, the next. The following two years, we saw a little bit of a recovery, and your climate denial community said, well, there you go. It's going to bounce back. Everything's going to be fine. Unfortunately, for the last uh, couple years, that downward trend has uh, reasserted itself 
and if anything it's accelerating uh, in a manner that the uh, uh, director of the National Snow and Ice Data Center, Mark Suarez, is calling a death spiral. So the, the, the mainstream view on uh, uh, polar uh, ice on the ocean is that we would expect to see in about 20 years, somewhere in the 2030 to 2040 range, uh, open water uh, in the Arctic Ocean for anywhere to four to six weeks during the summer. So about this time, uh, I'm going to show you one other thing, and then, then, I'll, uh, then I'll move on. But uh, this is another slide of the uh, ice at the North Pole. This comes to me from, uh, also from the National Snow and Ice Data Center. Here's the uh, polar ice during winter as it used to be back in 1987. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run this animation here for you. Here's uh, the white is the thickest ice. That's the so-called perennial ice that's made it through several years. And it's very thick and uh, uh, very massive. And I'm going to start this animation, and you can watch what is happening here. And what scientists are telling us is that as, as impressive as the, the shrinkage in area of the Arctic ice is, uh, it is the loss of the thickness and the mass of the ice that is even more spectacular. What you can see is you're freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing. You can see the summer and winter is going by, but that perennial ice is going away, okay? Year after year, we're up to 2004. 2005, very warm year. Now watch 2007. Boom. And it has not recovered from 2007, even though it still freezes out that one year ice does freeze out quite a ways during the winter, but uh, this is what all that's left of the ice that's making it through more than one year. So we're, we're at a point where given the right conditions, this ice is so thin uh, that the right combination of wind and sun and temperature could almost in any given year going forward uh, cause that ice to open up completely uh, during a given summer. So we're we're very close to kind of a tipping point with that ice, and it's just uh, kind of a matter of opinion whether it's 5 or 10 or 20 years uh, before we start seeing open water. Uh, the reason that's a big deal, many of you perhaps know, is because with all that ice up there, uh, the sun shining on the ice cap, 90% of, of the sunlight gets reflected from that bright white ice. Uh, but as it gets replaced by open water, then you get... 90% of that energy being absorbed into the dark water. So that's a feedback effect. Uh, less ice equals more heat, and more heat equals less ice, and it's a feedback and a spiral, okay? So all through the climate system, we see these feedback effects. This is one of the big ones, but there are many, many others. Now, at this point, people will ask me, okay, the ice is melting up there. Why isn't sea level rising? And uh, many of you have little glasses of ice water on your table, and you know that if the ice in your glass melts, the water's not going to overflow because the ice and the water just change place, right? That's what's happening up here. This is ice that's floating on the water. The ice that we're concerned about as far as sea level is here on the ice caps, Greenland and Ant Antarctica, okay? <coughs> Uh, up until a few years ago, we thought that both Greenland and, and Antarctica were going to continue to gain mass for the next 100 years or so uh, because we would think there would be more moisture in the air, there would be more snow, and, and uh, it, would, it would retain uh, more and more mass in these giant caps. Uh, what we know now, because we have much better data, uh, is that that's not true. We have the so-called gravity recovery and climate experiment satellites, these basically circle the Earth as a pair. They're actually a couple hundred miles apart, but they measure the distance between each other to um, a tolerance much less than a human hair. And as they pass over, say, a mountain range or a big pile of ice, the gravitational change causes them to shift orbitally and so they make calculations and we can in fact weigh the ice sheets with these satellites. And so now that we're doing that, we know that um, the, uh, both Greenland 
and Antarctica are in negative mass balance. They're both melting. And this, is, uh, this was presented by NASA at the American Geophysical Union about two years ago. Here's the year-by-year uh, -year graph. You can see it freezes, melts, freezes, melts, but basically the trend is downward. And so you can see graphs like this uh, that look very much like this for Antarctica as well. So you can argue about the rate that it's melting, but the, the general trend is downward, and it's about 100 years ahead of schedule of what we thought just 10 years ago. So um, sea level is an issue because the ice sheets are on the move. And um, uh, up until a few years ago, we, d we, d we didn't have a good idea of what the ice sheets were doing, and so a lot of the uh, studies were simply ignoring the ice sheets' contribution to sea level rise. Now that we have an idea, uh, we're starting to make some much better estimates. Now, this gentleman was giving a TED Talk uh, at the Pentagon about a year ago. This is Admiral David Titley, who is the chief oceanographer for the U.S. Navy. And I'll let him tell you what he thinks is happening with the ice sheets. And these glaciers are starting to fall apart much faster than anybody, even two years ago, thought they were going to do there. So this is going to be a huge issue. And potentially, we can see the seas coming up somewhere between three and six feet in the 21st century. Eight inches in the 20th century, three to six feet in the 21st century. Okay, so, you know, if you've been to Miami, if you've been to Baltimore, if you've been to Battery Park in New York City, it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to add an extra three to six feet on there, then throw in another five, ten, or twenty-foot storm surge, and you see the problem that we're heading into here. And uh, if we're going to get three to six feet by the end of the century, that means uh, they're expecting sometime by mid-century that the, we're going to start seeing eight, or, uh, eight inches or a foot every decade or so. And if the ice sheets begin to move at that pace, they're not going to stop when we want them to. Uh, they're going to go past uh, six feet. They're going to go to 15 or 20 feet, at least, uh, unless we get a handle on uh, our business as usual, uh, carbon dioxide. Now, the good news is we have solutions. The bad news is I don't have enough time to tell you about them. Uh, that's usually a big part of my presentation, and it's an important part of the presentation, but, you know, you guys are, are uh, uh, inured to, to all the bad news, so uh, I think you'll be okay. Uh, but just briefly, uh, uh, non-carbon energy sources, uh, wind, of course, is exploding. Uh, if you've uh, driven around uh, Gratiot County and Montcalm County in uh, Michigan lately, you've seen the hundreds of new turbines going up. That's part of it. And... Uh, the big wild card uh, is going to be how fast will solar photovoltaic uh, overtake the price of coal. Coal is gradually continuing to rise. Uh, we've actually got much less coal than, than we've been led to believe. Uh, uh, meanwhile, the cost of solar voltaic is uh, falling. And it's almost getting into a Moore's Law kind of situation, similar to what we saw with computer chips and computer memory over the last 30 or 40 years. So at some point, and, and you can argue whether it's two years, five years, or 10 years, uh, uh, photovoltaic solar becomes more cost effective uh, than, than buying your uh, electricity from the utility that's generally using coal. Uh, that's a paradigm shift. That is a wild card of technology. And I maintain that all of us uh, remember what, the, uh, what it was like to change from the pre-internet stage where almost nobody had a personal computer to just three or four years later, everybody had a PC, everybody was online three or four hours a night. And it wasn't because someone passed a law, it wasn't because people wanted to uh, boost the economy or anything like that, it was because the technology reached a stage where it was just too damn cool to stay away. Okay? And so uh, this is what we're looking at with photovoltaic right now. It's a wild card that's out there, but uh, at, at a certain point, it's just going to become uh, too damn compelling for uh, uh, all, of, all of the uh, big businesses, uh, uh, big uh, 
owners of uh, housing and malls and, and skyscrapers and everything else uh, to stay away. And then we're going to d turn our paradigm completely on its head and our buildings will no longer be uh, uh, mere consumers of energy. Our houses will not just be consumers of energy. We will actually be producers of energy all on our own. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, I, I couldn't take more time. I'm, I, I, I go around the state all the time and give these talks. So by all means, um, uh, check with Aaron. He's got my contact information. And you can also check online. Uh, climatecrocks.com is the blog. And there's a, a playlist for all the videos there. There's almost 100 videos in the series. And uh, uh, highly recommended if, uh, uh, especially with the holidays coming up, when your ditto head uncle comes over and you want to settle some arguments. <laughs> That's what they're for. So uh, uh, thank, thank you all for having me. It's been really a, a great experience, and I hope to come back again. So thank you.